This is the one with Victorian antiques of no consequence, the invention of time travel that goes wholly unused, the human factor, whatever that is, and dizzy, dizzy Daleks. It's called Evil of the Daleks. Here we go. We're embarking on a voyage all through time and all through space. Counting Daleks, Dalen Oot, and the Cybertronic race. Sontarans look like taters, and Silurians all have wonky scales. And the Doctor has a TARDIS, we're reviewing all his tales. Who back when? Reviewing all of who there is. Who back when? Subscribe and read on iTunes, please. Episode by episode, we're trudging down this temporal road. Come join us on this odyssey. What other choice could there be than who back when? Who back when? Hello, ladies and gentlemen of Podcast Land, and welcome to episode C036 of Who Back When, a Doctor Who podcast, or Doc Past, <laughs> in which we'll be taking a look at the Patrick Troughton serial, Evil of the Daleks. Who am I? I am Ponkin. Yes, I am. I'm back. And before I begin today's review, I just want to say a few words, just a totally non whovian tangent to start off with. Uh, this is the first episode of Who Back When that I've recorded in over a month. The couple of episodes that we dropped the past week, uh, they'd been recorded ages ago. <laughs> The reason the podcast went on sudden hiatus, as many of you already know, is that I was suddenly quite poorly and had to spend some time in hospital, but the doctors managed to reverse the polarity of my neutron flow, and consequently I've returned to the real world now, and gradually I'm turning back into a regular biped. If I sound a little less than 100%, please bear with me. The show must go on, and it will. And I really want to thank you uh, for all the kind words that so many of you sent me while I was still in there. Thank you for reaching out on the site and on Twitter and on email and on Facebook. <laughs> the, uh, the update on TV tropes brought a smile to my face as well. You guys are amazing. I could try, but I would undeniably fail to express just how much it meant to me to know that you find people are out there in the world. So please just accept this warm-hearted thank you. Okay, that's enough schmaltz. Any more cheese and you will become lactose intolerant just by sheer virtue of listening to me. Point is, I'm back and we've got the next few recordings already booked in now. In fact, I'm probably sitting down with my radtastic co-host to record our review of Smith & Jones tomorrow evening. Kablamo! Let's jump into this review for realsies. Okay, so first off, The Evil of the Daleks is a seven-episode arc. Uh, most of that is missing, hence I'm doing this review as a solo mission. And what I went through in order to absorb the serial into my cerebral cortex was to listen to the BBC audiobook. I'll include a pic of the cover on whobackone.com as well as watch the Loose Cannon Productions reconstruction, which, with this being seven episodes long and, spoilers, not one of my favorites, was a bit of a slog. Um, Loose Cannon did an admirable job as always, uh, but I'm afraid I recommend you listen to the audiobook if you want to take in the story instead, and obviously that you carry on listening to me <laughs> as I synopsize the shit out of it, Who Back When style. Oh, also, I watched a few related interviews that I'll embed on the site as well and that I'll go through in brief here. They're pretty cool. They're very, very interesting. Let's tackle a bite-sized chunk of Who first, though. Yep, it is B-Scout time. God damn it, I've missed this bit. Bite-sized chunk of Who. Doc and Jamie chase after the stolen TARDIS, as we saw at the end of The Faceless Ones in 1967's Gatwick Airport, and slowly but surely, they piece together a mystery that will lead them somewhere and sometime else entirely. The TARDIS has been stolen by a Mr. Waterfield, a chap who invented time travel back in Victorian times and who has travelled to his future, Doc's present, our past, to sell Victorian contemporary items as valuable antiques. He's not working alone, though. Also having mastered time travel and after the Doc are the Daleks. They've kidnapped Waterfield's daughter, Victoria, back in Victorian England, and are blackmailing him to kidnap the Doctor, take him back in time as well, and force him to perform an experiment on their behalf that could cost all of humanity their liberty. Beescow over, you are welcome. Yeah, for better or for worse, it's a pretty convoluted plot. So before I jump into the meat and bones of the serial, let's tackle the bonus material. There's an interview with a chap called Sonny Caldinez, who played mute strongman Kemmel. He was like the made-for-TV Dave Bautista of his time, and I looked him up. He's had cameos in a lot of other stuff, too. On Doctor Who, he's mostly played Ice Warriors, so he appeared as a human in Evil of the Daleks, duh. But from that point on, he'd only return as Ice Warriors. First in The Ice Warriors and Seeds of Death, both with Patrick Troughton's second Doctor, and then in The Curse of Peladon and The Monster of Peladon, both with John Pertwee's third. But he also appeared in non-Hoovian stuff, and I'll embed some screenshots on whobackwhen.com for this, just because it's badass. He appeared in The Man with the Golden Gun, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, and even in The Fifth Element. Caldinas has a few pretty cool behind-the-scenes stories, mostly about other actors and the physicality of his performance. 
totally worth watching from a completist point of view. Not convinced? Well, uh, he even mentions en passant that a murder was committed in the house where they were shooting, so that's pretty cool. Unique selling point. <laughs> I also watched and will embed an introductory interview with Colin Baker, the sixth doctor himself. This is the actual Loose Cannon Productions introduction to the recon. It turns out Colin Baker was Patrick Troughton's son's flatmate for a while, uh, and even the best man at his wedding. So obviously he has loads of insights into Troughton to provide. Absolutely watch that when you get a chance. Two more behind-the-scenes videos to go. Uh, I had a look at a very short production featurette narrated by Colin Baker. It's just like a couple of minutes long. I'll embed it on this episode's page on whobackwhen.com. Have a look. And lastly, and best of all, I cannot recommend that you watch this video enough. There's an interview with author John Peel. He's a Doctor Who author in general. He wrote uh, for Doctor Who magazine. He wrote a bunch of Dalek stories, novelizations, so on and so forth. He air quotes cooperated with Fairy Nation on a nut ton of them. I'm adding the air quotes because of, well, you'll have to watch the interview to find out. It's complicated and it's pretty gosh darn wonderful. Uh, so much trivia and behind the scenes stuff and intel on Terry Nation and his wife <laughs> and on how the writing of the stories was done back in the day in the first place. So watch it. Ditto embedding it on whobackwhen.com. Uh, that's about it for introductory stuff, really. Now I realize I say this every time and then I normally still end up going through the serial in question in painstaking detail, but I am fully intent on speeding through this mf -er. <laughs> Episode 1. We start off where we left off in The Faceless Ones with PB and J, that's Polly, Ben and Jamie, now reduced to just J, while PB no doubt are sinking pints in whatever sticky Weatherspoons pub Gatwick Airport housed back in the 1960s. Uh, Doc and Jamie, henceforth DJ, have noticed the TARDIS is gone and is steadily disappearing on the back of a lorry to Time Lord knows where, and therein ends the previously on Doctor Who. I should say I feel like this episode contains more characters than it needs, really. Take this dick ball, for instance, Bob Hall, he's, open bracket, posing as, closing bracket, an airport mechanic, and DJ speak with him about the missing TARDIS. Why? No reason. He's not a policeman or in charge of heavy luggage or anything, he's just at hand. Anyway, I'm going to put a pin in that for a little later. He tells them the TARDIS was taken by, dum-dum-dum, a Mr. J. Smith on behalf of the Leatherman Company. Been signed for. Yes, yeah, so I see. Uh, J. Smith. So we have an instance of John Smith in this episode, for no conceivable reason really, but nonetheless it is worth noting. Later on in Classic Who, and certainly New Who to a great extent, the Doc will often use the alias John Smith, I assume because it's like the most common pasty white dude name ever. In this case there's no reference to the Doc's alias, obviously, so it's probably used because it's so common a name, but who knows if encountering this obviously fake name here would later inspire the Doctor to take on the alias for himself. Very, very cool. Anyway, another honcho named Kennedy, no relation, is eavesdropping and reports back to Edward Waterfield, whom we'll get to know in a sec. Uh, should point out, and I'm probably jumbling plot points around a bit here, uh, but Bob Hall isn't really a mechanic. He's been told by Kennedy, who's been told by Waterfield, to pose as a mechanic for DJ and to tell them about the David Leatherman Company. Uh, but DJ don't fall for it, and there was no guarantee they'd ask him about it in the first place. The clever thing would be for them to call out for a policeman, or even to just blindly panic. <laughs> So my point is, Waterfield is already a shitty evil genius in my eyes at this point. Plus, the Leatherman thing doesn't pan out at all either, because obviously they don't follow that fake lead. But we don't find out what it was meant to do. For all we know, there's some super elaborate plot behind it, but it's never revealed to us. What the shizness? Okay, spoiler coming up. Waterfield needs DJ to come to his pad at a certain hour so he can kidnap them and take them back in time with him. Okay, that's cool, I suppose. I, I already mentioned this in the B-Scow. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself here. First anyway of the recording, by the way. DJ follow Bob Hall, aka unconvincing mechanic guy, who goes to meet Kennedy at some other location and is super knocked out by Kennedy just before DJ arrives. So again, and really, I'm sorry for rambling when I'm meant to be speeding, but I think that'll abate after episode one. Kennedy has left a clue for them to follow. It's a matchbox from the Tricolor Cafe, and he's invested a degree of minutiae here as DJ step back out of the scene thinking they need to find a chap named Ken, aka Kennedy, who's left-handed in said cafe. But what the F? Does this pan out? Nope. Does it matter? Nope. Could Kennedy just have told them where to go, thus saving us an episode of this drivel to watch and, and Bob Hall a serious beating? Yep. Uh, super duper annoying. In the meantime, we meet Waterfield. He's a Victorian gentleman, yep, in 1967, uh, who runs an antique shop specializing in very authentic looking Victoriana, and he's got lots of marvelous Victorian idiosyncrasies, ranging from his period clothing and his sideburns to his impeccable manners and the Victorian stick up his ass. Here's the shtick. 
Different shtick. Not the one up his ass. Uh, you may already have deduced this on your own. He is a real Victorian chap. And the antiques are authentic items from his time that he's selling off as antiques in the relative present. His future of 1967. Kind of makes you think of City of Death with Tom Baker as the fourth doctor. In which an alien traveled back in time and got Leonardo da Vinci to produce exact replicas of La Gioconda that he then sold in da Vinci's relative future. Right? Very similar. Anyway, is this a cool idea? Yeah, it's badass. Is it of importance to this serial? Nope, not at all. Uh, not only could we have gotten rid of this plot line entirely, we could have also just set this story in Victorian times and had the Doctor go straight there instead of including this convoluted opening ep. We also meet another of Waterfield's assistants here, Perry, who's a cheerful 1960s chap who's pleased to be earning not tons of cashish in his role as not sure exactly what he does for Waterfield. Um, either way, he's clearly not in on the bad guy scheme. He's far too jovial anyway. Cue the next pointless plot points. Pointless plot points? Jesus, what the hell am I saying? Um, you know what I mean. Anyway, ugh, second anyway. Perry is meant to go to the cafe and tell DJ to meet Waterfield at X o'clock. So again, why not just tell them this in the first place? What if they hadn't sold the cafe matchstick conundrum and gone elsewhere instead, for instance? Waterfield's plans would have been foiled. Whatever. In order for Perry to recognize DJ, Waterfield hands him promo stills or agency headshots <laughs> of both, including a photo of Jamie in the, in the serial The Highland apparently without him noticing that his picture is being taken in the time before cameras had even been invented. So pretty impressive stuff. I'll include a screenshot of that on whobackone.com. We also see Waterfield, this was before Perry entered, sorry, entering a secret chamber that's kitted out to be super high-tech and shiny and from whence he retrieves an authentic Victorian jug to add to his collection. So some pretty sinister sci-fi stuff is going down. You know what I'm saying? And I, I, I am actually 100% on board with that. I think it's super cool. Cut to the cafe, where, hang on, I'm gonna soundbite this. Yep, I may be admitting my own cultural ignorance here, but that is the only time I have ever heard that song outside of Mel Brooks's Spaceballs. <laughs> And on the topic of background music, we also get the second instance of The Beatles. Could see that. Paperback writer. Good tune. The last time we heard and in fact saw the Beatles was in The Chase, when uh, Hartnell, Babs, Ian and Susie snuck a peek at a gig of theirs using the space-time visualizer. Enter Perry, who tells DJ, who are sure it's a trap, to be there at 10pm, which... Uh, whatever. Back to the pin I mentioned before. Who cares? You already know it's dumb. Point is, DJ agree they'll be there at 10. Then we see Waterfield in his secret high-tech bondage closet. Hooray! Haven't mentioned that on the podcast in a while. Apparently trying to transmit a request for information to someone, but not receiving a reply. Episode almost over. Still in Waterfield's office, now empty. Did I say empty? Not for long. Kennedy, who by the way looks and sounds like a total ruffian compared to the well-quaffed Perry, breaks in, finds the high-tech bondage closet, and randomly presses some buttons which... Dum dum dum. Make a Dalek appear. Yep, that's right. You guessed it. Evil of the Daleks is a Dalek serial. <laughs> End of episode one. Episode two. Bing bong, Kennedy's killed by the Dalek, who promptly dematerializes again. DJ now appear, half an hour early as to elude Waterfield, great plan guys, and we get A, Jamie assuming correctly what's going on vis-a-vis -vis the Victorian angle, and B, Doc's confirmation of the let's sell antique contemporary objects as present day antique subplot that I mentioned before and that is of zero consequence to this serial. But about A, can someone please explain to me how Jamie knows about Victorian times? <laughs> <laughs> Massive plot hole. Whatevs. We also get a fun scene in which Doc tells Jamie not to knock anything over and doesn't notice that Jamie keeps the Doc from knocking over a vase or something. It's slapstick, and it is, uh, maybe this is just a guilty pleasure of mine. I find it totally hilarious. We get a, a quick cut scene of Waterfield expressing his displeasure with the Dalek having killed Kennedy now, because for no reason whatsoever the Dalek is back again. I say for no reason because it's about to disappear again. And then DJ enter, meet Perry, and find Kennedy's corpse lying on the floor. Perry shits himself and dashes for the nearest copper, while DJ remain to solve another unnecessary mystery. Presumptuously laid out to lure them into the bondage closet, then they're not unconscious by some sort of gas, uh, which seems to be a trope in Trout and Who, at which point Waterfield takes their bodies to the platform and the three of them dematerialize, so unnecessarily. 
we've already seen the Dalek. Don't assume they'll be able to solve your little riddles, Waterfield. Don't try to trick them, Dalek. Just effing threaten them. Force them to operate according to your will under duress. That's what bad guys are meant to do. You amateurs, you dilettantes. All right, fade to the year 1886, where Doc regains consciousness next to a still knocked out Jamie and is given a restorative, quote unquote, by a maid named Molly, reminding me quite a bit of the first episode of, um, or indeed Woodhouse's first story about, uh, Jeeves and Worcester. If you're not familiar with a TV show, by the way, this is another tangent, starring um, Hugh Laurie and uh, Stephen Fry, Jeeves and Worcester, definitely check it out. Wonderful show. Reminds me of childhood afternoons in front of the TV. All right, so moving on. We meet Theodore Maxtable, the chap whose house it is and apparently a colleague, or more, uh, pin, <laughs> of Waterfield's. Waterfield turns up as well. See, I'm speeding now. And we learn that he was actually just acting on the orders of a higher power, as he puts it, i.e. the Daleks. It turns out they've kidnapped his daughter, Victoria, of, spoiler alert, future companion Victoria Waterfield fame. And unless he does exactly as they say, that is, unless he act out each individual and superfluous step in their ridiculously and presumptuously elaborate plan, they'll do time lord knows what to her, plunge her. In fact, we even get a cutscene of a Dalek threatening to force feed her. Sexy. <laughs> Kidding. Uh, Doc and we get a guided tour of Maxtable and Waterfield's laboratory, which is absolutely stunning. Although, frankly, a better exp experience in the audiobook. It feels steampunky and edgy, uh, and even the explanation of their experiment is absolutely marvellous. Now, this is my theory. A mirror reflects an image, does it not? Yes. So, you may be standing there, and yet appear to be standing 50 feet away. Well, following the new investigations 12 years ago by J. Clark Maxwell into electromagnetism and the experiments by Faraday into static electricity. Static? Correct. Waterfield and I first attempted to define the image in the mirror and then to project it. There's the mention of static electricity, i.e. in the universe, who else could it be? Doc puts it all together, and we learn that Max Dibble and Waterfield were creating a time machine, but accidentally allowed the Daleks to enter their time, who in turn kidnapped Victoria and blackmailed them to kidnap the Doctor. Then, check this out, a Dalek turns up and threatens to destroy the TARDIS unless Doc helps them with an experiment of their own. What? That is precisely what they should have done in the first place. Screw this past episode and a half. You're the ultimate bad guy. Just use the threat of violence. And don't get me wrong, ladies and gentlemen of Podcast Land, albeit annoyingly stupid at times, I have enjoyed this episode and a half so far. I'm just saying the Daleks don't have the faintest idea of how to be proper bad guys. Not yet, anyway. Or possibly not in this serial. Maybe... Oh, I don't know, maybe not in, yeah, I'm going to say that, not in this serial. These are Hanna-Barbera levels of antagonism. Ipso facto, I disapprove. Anyway, what is that, the third one so far? We now get wind of the actual arc of this serial, not too dissimilar from the Celestial Toymaker, which I hated, by the way. Uh, we're going to have one of our protagonists, namely Jamie, subjected to a series of challenges one after the other. The point of it all, the Daleks have realized the humans constantly beat them, which, hang on, I need to address that as well. <laughs> Pin. <laughs> uh, so in order to counteract that, they essentially want to transplant that winning bit of humanity into themselves, and Jamie's the lab rat they've chosen to observe. Another pin. Let's start with that ladder pin. Not sure how the Doctor factors into all this. Doc's not human, so he wouldn't make a good guinea pig, I suppose, and surely Jamie's... Jamie's are like ten a penny, man. There are plenty of suitable candidates out there. Why kidnap DJ and subject Jamie to this toy maker esque merry-go-round when they could just as easily have just picked some other, more readily available human badass? And... They have the Doc's TARDIS. Screw holding it for ransom. Investigate. Research it. Transplant whatever makes the TARDIS a super-duper badass piece of engineering into your Dalek shells instead. Sloppy Daleks. Very sloppy. As to the former pin, this one's just a case of Doctor Who having evolved into a slightly different beast now compared to what it was like in Troughton's time. Nowadays, the Daleks are all about racial purity. I mean, even back then, I suppose they were. They were the sci-fi Nazis, right? But in any event, nowadays, you wouldn't see the Daleks jeopardizing their purity to even the slightest degree. Take the audiobook Blood of the Daleks, for instance, which was the first one that JD and I reviewed on Who Back When, where Daleks fight each other over who's more Dalek. Okay, let's get back to the serial. Cut to the end of the episode, we meet Ruth Maxtable, Theodore's daughter, and then Jamie and Molly are both knocked over the head by some henchmen, and by the time Doc arrives, Jamie is gone. Oh, one more thing. I think this happens around about now. This is Maxtable's house, right? 
And on the wall, there is a massive portrait of Waterfield's wife, who was a massive hussy. <laughs> and we learn her daughter, Victoria, looks just like her. But why does Maxtable have a goddamn portrait of his colleague's wife on his wall? <laughs> hey? All right, something tells me I'm not done theorizing about that in this review. Blah, 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 blah. We end episode two on the Daleks ordering Maxtable, referred to as Maximum Overdrive, until I can think of something better, really. To start the experiments, or they will kill the Doctor. So yeah, let's have a think about that for a moment, too. Maximum Overdrive, ugh, really need to think of a better nickname, clearly doesn't give half a shit about the Doc Hammer, though. And if we're to believe that he's loyal to his companion, whose wife he has a wank poster of in his living room, I think it's safe to say that his, uh, as in the colleague's, Waterfield's main priority, is his daughter, so why would the Daleks change their play here? And also, wait, killing the Doctor is an option? So get on with it, then, you motorized dustbins. Humans haven't been thwarting the Daleks. The Doctor has. So kill him instead. Forget about this transplant malarkey and get back to taking over the universe. Deep sigh. End of episode two. Episode three. We learned that Jamie was kidnapped by a chap named Toby, which, <laughs> in the context of this podcast, I now can't help but think is, as the Drudenmeister pointed out, the name of a Jack Russell, not some badass. Um, that's from our review of the Satan Pit. Ugh, tipsy memories. Toby, anyway, is like a local henchman, I think, of this other chap, Arthur Terrell, who in turn is the fiancé of Ruth Maxtable, the daughter of Old Man Maxtable. Though while he looks like Karl Marx won a pie-eating competition, seriously, I'm not kidding about that, check out the screenshot on whobackone.com, uh, Ruth, his daughter, looks like she's famished for some schlong. Blah, blah, blah. Doc tracks down Jamie to a barn on the estates, and then Jamie overhears him saying something about the Daleks going to go to town on Jamie's ass, uh, which leads Jamie to assume the Doc, like some rancid turncoat, has sold him out and is now cooperating with the enemy. Which, let's face it, isn't actually that far from the truth. Enter Kemmel, stage left, let's say. Kemmel's a massive hulk of a man who's mute and clearly overcompensating for something. He's a strong man. How do we find that out? Easy peasy. He enters frame and, I shit you not, bends an iron bar like he's Popeye. Then he punches the shit out of a plank. Like that plank ever hurt anyone. And this is how the Daleks intend to fish the human factor out of Jamie, by telling Kemmel that Jamie's a scoundrel and that he, Kemmel that is, must keep him, Jamie that is, from entering the house. So I guess it's brain versus brawn, right? Jamie will need to gain entrance to the house, outwitting the mute behemoth, and basically rescuing Victoria from the foreigner. And whatever stratagem he employs... I take it that's the human factor, right? I guess so. Let's continue and see what the Daleks' master plan is this time. Oh yeah, crapola, I forgot. So we do actually get an explanation for why they chose Jamie for the experiment. Uh, sorry, forgot, forgot to mention this. Apparently the fact that he's been traveling around space and time with the Doc makes him more human than anyone else. Interesting. So, A, wouldn't it be easy to just grab, say, Ben and Polly, who are nowhere near the meddlesome Doc Hammer, and who in fact travel around space and time way longer than Jamie has done so far? In fact, why not just grab Ian and Barbara? <laughs> Doc couldn't give a smaller fudge about them at this point in his career. And B, wait, say, what now? That doesn't add up. So there's... Here's what I'm assuming. The Daleks, these ones anyway, crap, so many anyways, let's reinstate the Hubak when drinking game. Ugh, blurg. In any event, <laughs> in any case, these Daleks think the Doc's companions do all the work, and he's just their space-time chauffeur. They've said humans beat them at every turn, but as far as I'm aware, humans have, to date, always required the Doctor to beat the Daleks. If so, fact, the humans they're referring to must be the companions, right? Because otherwise, they, they could have just pulled the frankel braces off one of their robo-men and subjected that poor bastard to their ridiculous test. Okay, back to the episode. Jamie confronts the Dockmeister about jerking off Waterfield and Maxtable and sets about rescuing Victoria. Turns out Jamie has a massive boner for her because, weirdly, we saw a portrait of her mother, which, again, weirdly, Maxtable has on his living room wall. Jamie saw that and he's had an erection ever since. Bing bong. Toby, a.k.a. Jack Russell, and Terrell aka, what was it, Ruth's fiancé, have an altercation about Toby's henchman fees, and Toby steals what I can only assume is his rightful payment, and not a penny more, from Terrell. This is really not of consequence. I might cut that out. Terrell, by the way, is like one of those fainting goats. <laughs> Every time he's on screen, he is getting woozy. Whatever. Very important plot point, that is. <laughs> Spoiler alert, he is about to be darlicked to death. Anyway, drink people. Jamie's prepping to Ethan Hunt into the house, and we learn that his... M emotions during the impossible mission are to be recorded and analyzed by the motorized dustbins. And somehow, Doc's meant to manipulate said emotions. How and to what end, I may have just missed. I'm not sure. Cut to Toby attempting to burglarize the house and being Daleked to death. 
Did I mention that before? I did, didn't I? So he's dead now, and we, the audience, have had visual confirmation that Ethan hunting into the house is no simple endeavor. Kablamo! Impending cliffhanger alert. Jamie manages to evade a booby trap, which, A, is a great word, <laughs> and B, I totally forgot to mention before. Yeah, there was a booby trap, whatever. He evades the booby trap as a bird triggers it. Let's make that clear. Not through cunning, but through sheer happenstance. This should have no effect on the human factor. And then, dum dum dum, Kemmel appears, and we've got ourselves a whole week back in 1967 until we get to see them face off. Sucks to be you, 1967. End of episode 3, episode 4. If watching still images of two pixelated dudes fighting for way too long is your bag, then the beginning of this reconned episode is for you, amigo. Or amiga, sorry. Don't mean to be sexist. So they fight, and one thing leads to another, and Kemmel nearly falls off the roof of the house. But Jamie saves his bacon, and to return to the favor, Kemmel saves him from a Dalek axe trap. Kind of reminiscent of that booby trap that almost decapitated Ian in the Keys of Marinus. See, that was a good serial. Deep sigh. Just a quick note about this booby. Uh, <laughs> so the Daleks have plopped a handkerchief on the floor. Victoria's handkerchief, one assumes. And as Jamie tries to pick it up, because why wouldn't you? Am I right? Yeah. The Daleks release a huge F-off axe in his direction. If it weren't for Kemmel, that would have been the end of the experiment. What the shit would the Daleks have learned from that, apart from the most intrinsically human individual in space-time likes to pick up ladies' snot paper off the floor? Bloody stupid is what that is. Anyway, oh, drink. Kemmel and Jamie now bond over their, we learn, mutual admiration of Victoria's, uh, secrets. <laughs> 36 serials into Doctor Who and we finally have two dudes who want to plow the same dudes and cooperate to save her. That's something we've missed on the show. And is it just me or do you reckon Jamie just wants to trick the Hulk and slide into her britches on his own instead? Yeah, I reckon that's the case. Jamie's got a trick or two up his kilt. Meanwhile, Old Man Waterfield is having second thoughts about all this Dalek business, suddenly thinking that it may be a little on the shady side, morally speaking, what with all the murders and all. And now he wants to turn himself into the police doesn't want to turn himself into the police, he wants to turn himself in to the police. <laughs> Sorry, I really put the uh, emphasis on the wrong syllable there. Uh, but don't get me wrong, he wants to see the whole cruel scientific experiment through to the end first, because, I guess, his daughter's safety is at stake and secretly he doesn't give a damn about the murders. Karl Marx's second breakfast is not a fan, though, and pulls the Victorian equivalent of a Glock on his ass, gets him to help him carry Toby's charred corpse to the barn, and then attempts to shoot him, at which point, actually I'll say what happens for a sec, um, at this point I was thinking, so this is why Waterfield Stepford wife's portrait is hanging on the wall in Maxtable's house. Old Man Waterfield is totally his bitch. Karl Marx's pancake diet was probably boning down with Waterfield's sexy spouse too, hence the portrait, n'est-ce pas? Interestingly enough, what happens next is that Terrell, the future son-in-law of Karl Marx's meatball marathon, i.e. Ruth Maxtable's fiancé, steps in and basically saves Waterfield's life, telling Karl Marx's overdue cholesterol test not to stray from their plan and to obey his command. So Terrell is in charge, and more importantly, maybe the one porking Victoria Waterfield's suspiciously identical-looking mother. <laughs> Sadly, we will never find that out. Let's bullet point the plot for a bit to save some time. Shazam! Jamie manages to save Kemmel from another potentially experiment-ending booby trap. Kablamatron! They spy a Dalek sentry checking up on Vix. Bajing bajing! Doc asserts that the Daleks have successfully recorded, quote, instinct, which, as far as I was aware, is not an emotion, not even one that Doc might be able to manipulate. Uh, hold up. How has he manipulated any of Jamie's emotions so far, actually? Or, or actually, that was probably just the crappy way he NLP'd him to go say Vix. Yeah, Doc is fairly useless at this point, as in, he's without consequences, what I'm saying. I'm loving him, but he really, he's not really playing a part in the story. Next bullet point, blam! Cut to later that same night, Terrell, of possibly boning Victoria's mum's fame, uh, is having an altercation with Molly, the maid, whom I think I mentioned before. Whatever. She works there, no doubt spending half a day's cleaning up after Karl Marx's Bernays bath time. Uh, their argument is about Hot Vicky. Ugh, I think of a good nickname for her in upcoming review as well, I promise. Molly's saying she's heard Victoria's voice in the house, which infuriates him. Then his fiancée, Ruth Maxtable, of the looking nothing like her father Maxtables, plops into frame, hoping to sway Terrell to turn over a new leaf, but he just shuns her like she's yesterday's crossword puzzle. 
and we snap cards to another argument because, hey, they're great fun. Maxtable's arguing with a Dalek this time, demanding they hold up their end of the deal, and we learn what that is pretty goddamn pronto. He is researching the alchemical transformation of base metals into gold. This nutbag wants to be an alchemist, and he reckons the Daleks will help him achieve that. Cliffhanger alert, Jamie and Kemmel straight up murder a Dalek by like lassoing it and swinging it into a fireplace. The quarterback is toast. R.I.P. Hans Gruber. Anyway, he... I know that wasn't Hans's line. You don't have to tell me that on Twitter. I love Die Hard. How dare you suggest otherwise. Anyway, that's not the... Ugh, drink people. That's not the cliffhanger. They now use the rope to scale a wall up to a balcony. And there's a behind-the-scenes anecdote about that in the uh, Sonny Caldina's video, by the way. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to spoil that right away. Uh, he mentions that he was all oiled up for the shots so that he would look more muscular and, you know, just intimidating. But because he was so greased up, <laughs> you kept sliding down the rope. So, I, so shooting the scene of him climbing up the rope would actually just take forever. It was very, very complicated. Anyway, fun little interlude there. Then they enter Hot Vicky's cell, at which point another Dalek appears, and dum dum dum, end of episode four. That is the cliffhanger ending. Episode five. Let's do this choose your own adventure style. If you want Jamie and Kemmel to easily dispatch the Dalek off the balcony into a fiery death below, listen on. If you want Jamie and Kemmel to start jacking each other off while talking smart about their shared adoration for Victoria's loins, see a shrink. Ouch, says the Dalek, and dies from either the fall, the explosion, or of its tonsil life support systems failing inside the Dalek casing. Good choice, dear listener. Was that fun? I'm not sure it was. Will I cut it out? Don't think I can be bothered. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. Feeling slightly self-conscious, though. Need to speed through the rest of this episode now. <laughs> An alarm goes off, alerting other Daleks to Jamie's and Kemmel's presence. Like, what kind of lackadaisical outfit are they running here? I thought they were constantly monitoring Jamie. How could they need an alarm? And surely having him beat Dalek grunts is what they want him to do, right? So that they can register his motions or whatnot. Right? That makes sense. I mean, they want... They want him to be a superior human, or a superior warrior, or whatever. A human superior warrior, is what I'm trying to say. So that they can monitor him, they can like just EKG that shit, and then when he has acted out his superiority, they know how he did it. What's the secret? But instead, they fucking alarm the shit and they lose track of him. Like, what is- I- Oh, it's so annoying. In any case, ugh. Jamie and Kemmel. <laughs> JK for short. Barge into Victoria's cell and seal the door. We get a cutscene of Doc f figuring out about Terrell, of married to Ruth, or and possibly, as yet unconfirmed, sticking it to Hot Vicky's identical twin mum fame. Troughton then has a quick William Hartnell moment. What an extraordinary collection, isn't it? Hmm? And Doc posits that as Terrell's never eaten or drunken, he's clearly under Dalek influence, as though constantly having a touch of the vapors and not wanting to spend any time with his actual fiance or treating his future father-in-law like his slave weren't sufficient indications that something's amiss with the poor chap. Here's a cool thing, though. We also learn that Terrell is ever so slightly magnetic. Isn't that awesome? I think that's pretty great, as sci-fi symptoms go. Cut to a moment later, Terrell, the chap who may or may not be giving the Waterfield Milf the plunger, hearing a Dalek voice repeating the word obey inside his noggin. Actually, there's a fantastic doctor line right before that that I really, really want to soundbite as well, just because it's wonderfully doctory and, sorry if this kills the mood, massively bonerific. No, Mr. Terrell, I am not a student of human nature. I am a professor of a far wider academy, of which human nature is merely a part. All forms of life interest me. Bullet point time. Kapow! Hot Vicky tells JK she was somehow brainwashed into willingly going with the Daleks, and Jamie reckons it was an inside job. Uh huh, uh huh, oh yeah, but he's thinking of an inside job. Mm hmm, yeah, that's enough. Next bullet point. Rock! Karl Marx at a Chinese all you can eat buffet hypnotizes Molly into forgetting all about hearing Hot Vicky's voice, and we learn he was also the one to hypnotize Hot Vicky in the first place. Yeah? Kablamo, the giant blob of flubber that ate Karl Marx and then roughly assumed his guys, albeit at a far greater size, orders Terrell. <laughs> God, this, this nickname just keeps getting more and more convoluted. Uh, he orders Terrell of 50 50 odds on him taking Hot Vicky's mum to the bone zone to go fetch Hot Vicky. So now, although we've had precisely zero explanation for this, Carl Markstable <laughs> is now bossing around his son in law instead. Wait, what? Shazam! We learn the doc is not so useless to the Daleks after all. He's. 
taking all those super interesting traits that Jamie exhibited during his dauntless Ethan hunting into the estate of Karl Marx's reflection in a funhouse mirror, and is transferring them into positronic brains. Oh, behold my Star Trek boner. Uh, and those positronic brains, he is then going, uh, they're then going to be used to create three experimental super Daleks. So soon, one supposes, there'll be three tonsils waking to life with a tremendous urge to copulate with future companion <laughs> Victoria Waterfield. Can't blame them, really. <laughs> Though poor Daleks can only squeeze one boob at a time. Oh. Uh, cut to Hot Vicky's cell, where the Daleks are now melting the door using some corrosive liquid that appears corrosive only to doors. <laughs> And while JK are busy trying to hold off the incoming dustbins, Terrell of blah 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 fame, you know his shtick by now, enters through a secret door in the wall and nabs Vicky. She's gone now, right? Nothing JK can do, right? This is the cliffhanger, right? Need to stop saying right. Nope, times three, mon ami. JK head into the secret tunnel after them, Jamie, Jason, Statham's Terrell, uh, then they're joined by Doc, who has done nothing but help the Daleks since this whole spiel started, Ruth, who's presumably never seen her fiancé naked, and Molly, whom I'm pretty sure Double McMarx hypnotized just a mo ago, but who, for some reason, is still part of this story, they all show up, and the Doc Hammer frees Terrell from the bonds of Dalek mind control by removing a device from around his neck. Let's segue into the least exhilarating cliffhanger in a long time with the following three bullet points, shall we? Boom! Kemmel is ordered to carry Hot Vicky, who's passed out, by the way, into their time machine. Kapow! Jamie tells Doc to go suck himself for being a turncoat piece of garbage. Blam! The three super Daleks wake up and... It saddens me to say, they are stupid children. And we end the episode on them playing trains and roundabouts with the Doctor. Here, have a soundbite of that, why don't you? Taking me for a ride! Jamie! They're playing a game! It's a game! Barf, I just vomed into my lap. How the mighty have fallen. This falls into the same category as clowns for me. <laughs> I mean, speaking of the, the celestial toy maker, really just grosses me out. Uh, this kind of childish nonsense. Anyway, end of episode five. I just said anyway again. God damn it, drink people. Episode six. Doc names the three super Daleks Alpha, Beta, and Omega. Interesting that he'd call the third one Omega, by the way, and not Gamma, I think. It's like he's hinting to us. Don't worry, guys. This is the last one of this batch we'll ever cook up and ruin your day with. And also, I'm sorry for ending on a preposition. <laughs> he also explains that they actually are children and now teaches them about friendship. This is Jamie and I'm Doctor. We are friends. 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 Jamie. Yes. Doctor. Friends! Friends! Ugh. And then all the Daleks, including Alpha, Beta, and Omega, are to return to Skaro. There's a really quick and slightly jumbled cutscene of the Daleks presenting the ogre who ate Karl Marx in utero with a bomb and telling him to go get the Doc pronto, which he doesn't. But that's fine, apparently, because he dematerializes and goes to Skaro. Then Old Man Waterfield finds Doc and Jamie, and the three of them also go to Skaro in the teleporter time machine thingy. And then the bomb explodes. No more Karl Marx estates. And depending on how big the bomb was, maybe no more Molly either. <laughs> and whatever other servants were in the house. What the fuck, man? Or did Molly go off with Ruth and Terrell, actually? Maybe they did. I doubt it. Uh, I bet she's dead, and no one gives a rat's ass. The scene is, word for word, exactly like the Downton Abbey finale, by the way. Spoiler alert. Whoop whoop, we're on Scarrow. God, I've missed this place. This is the o this is only the second time in Doctor Who so far, classic Who that is, that we see this place. <laughs> I'm so pleased. Uh, not counting the Cushing movies, obviously. The last time we saw the planet Scarrow, the last time that we were on the planet Scarrow, was in the second ever Doctor Who serial, The Daleks, with William Hartnell. Uh, oh, man. And that was a fantastic serial again. Oh, deep sigh. Okay, so we get a cutscene of Mute Kemmel, Hot Vicky, and Karl Marx, if he ate a bunch of yeast and sat in the sun all day. <laughs> Locked in a cell in the Dalek City. Victoria's totally shut up by the whole intergalactic travel thing, but Kemmel's there, topless and greased up to protect her. In said second ever Doctor Who serial, The Daleks, a review of which you have to listen to, by the way, I reviewed that with Who Back When co-creator Flapjack. And also, if you haven't heard former co-host The Raw Meisters and my review of the cinematic adaptation Doctor Who and the Daleks with Peter Cushing, then for the love of all that is good and pure in the universe, listen to it. Muy, muy pronto. 
Um, if it's too, oh, sorry, hang on, this is a total tangent, but if it's too old to find on iTunes, by the way, iTunes normally shows, like, they, they normally only show the latest 50 episodes, so if, if you can't find these episodes there on iTunes, then you can find them, in fact, you can find all past episodes at whobackwhen.com, and you can even download the MP3s right off the site to transfer into your portable pop machine and to listen to on the go. So thank goodness for technology. All right, back to the episode. So they are in the tunnels is what I was saying. Why? I have no idea. One would assume that the teleporter time machine thingy would send everyone to the same time and place, right? But yet again, we have a convenient separation at rematerialization. The last time that we had that was in the Daleks' master plan when they actually jumped into a teleporter. <laughs> All right, so they trigger some sort of alarm, though. So the Daleks jump on their Dalek CCTV, and I'm going to jump back into bullet point land. Number one, a black Dalek has a chat with Omega, goes, shit, man, what did they do to you? And takes him away. Number two, Karl Marx, after eating his way out of a Twinkie factory, is taken away and tortured by the Daleks. And Hot Vicky is next in line. Number three, why am I saying three? Apparently I swapped the bullet points for an ordered list. Anyway, ugh, drink people. Three, DJ and Old Man Waterfield hear Hot Vicky scream. And then as they're hurrying to save her, they suddenly encounter a Dalek claiming to be Omega. Which, like, what now? Because it's not Omega. And Doc recognizes it as an imposter and straight up murder death kills it by simply pushing it into the nearest crevasse. That's how easy it is to kill one of these MFs in 1967. Or, well, you know, whatever time... I don't know what year it is on Scaro. No one's like... Actually, that's a good point. No one has told us what year it is on Scaro. All right, whatever. My point was, why would it feign being Omega? Could it not just laser blast DJ and Waterfield instead? Wouldn't that make more sense? What the fuck, 347? I'm assuming you're 347, by the way. You have one job to do, and you mess it up. All right, boom, we're out of the ordered list and back to bullet points again. Um, it turns out Hot Vicky wasn't being tortured after all, probably because many of the kids watching this in 1967 would otherwise have grown up to have dubious Google search histories, but also, I feel it's pertinent to mention, because the Daleks, as awesome and menacing as they are in most classic serials, are kind of pants in this one. It transpires Carl Markstable just twisted her arm a little to make her scream, so Doc and Co. would hear her. Wow. So, was he tortured? Uh, I don't know. Maybe he was fake screaming in agony earlier as well. But why would he do that? Shit, this is a bit of a head-scratcher. All right, awesome cliffhanger alert. Doc, Jamie, and Old Man Waterfield are found out and brought before the Emperor Dalek. Holy smokes. This is where that character began. This is the first time we see him, and it's pretty awesome. You know how the Daleks were referred to as Pepper Pots once? Uh, I can't remember which serial that was in now. Well, in any case, the Emperor Dalek really looked like a Pepper Pot. <laughs> he doesn't quite have the same shape as the Daleks. He's taller. He doesn't look mobile at all. In fact, he's standing on a platform of sorts, hooked up to all these hoses coming out of the walls. It's, it's pretty badass. And even sounds different. So, you are the Doctor. We meet at last. I wondered if we ever would. The experiment is over. And here's the cliffhanger. Doc knew all along that the human factor would turn the Dalek Empire into a galactic short bus. But the Emperor reveals that he too had an ulterior motive. In conducting the test, they've also identified the Dalek factor. Dum dum dum. That evil drive to follow orders and exterminate everything good in the universe. And he now wants the Doctor to sow the seeds of said Dalek factor throughout all of Earth's history. They will be impregnated with the Dalek factor. Possibly one of the sexiest chat-up lines ever uttered by a tonsil with a toilet cleaning appliance for a hand. Anyway, oh, stop saying anyway. Just to clarify, even in this serial, the Daleks have mastered time travel, so if they needed the Doc's help to identify the Dalek factor, I don't understand why they need his help to disseminate it across Earth's past. Also, what does this mean exactly? Doc popped the human factor into a positronic brain that went into the Dalek's electronic casing. How is he going to, quote-unquote, implant the Dalek factor into humans? Throughout history, no less. And goddammit, what is this Dalek factor in the first place? Surely the Daleks already knew what their deal was. Why would they need this elaborate bullshit test? What the hell, guys? All right, end of episode six, episode seven. The final episode in which Doc plays his goddamn recorder. And in which the good guys, by which I mean everyone who's not a Dalek, including the bad guys, <laughs> are put in a cell. So now Victoria and her pops are reunited. And I suppose it's nice, but given the circumstances, as in they're not quite out of the woods yet, you know, it's naturally subdued. We also get two characters putting an ideological foot down right off the bat. First off, the Doctor clarifies that he'd never go along with the Dalek plan and would rather sacrifice all of their lives to protect mankind. 
Nice chap, really. Interestingly, he even considers taking them to Gallifrey for a mole there. I suppose I might try and take you all to another universe. I might even try and take you to my own planet. Your own? Yes. Yes, I, I live a long, long way away from Earth. So this is really re-establishing that moral core that the Doctor represents in Doctor Who. But that's, frankly, in this entire series so far, and this is episode 7, we've not really seen yet. There's not been enough scope for it. Secondly, some Dalek questions a direct order from the Dalek Emperor, so clearly the human factor is now spreading across the Dalek race already. But the Daleks still have a trick up their plunger and, and con Karl Marxable into believing he's finally going to get the formula for turning lead into gold, while what they're actually doing is plopping the d -d 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 Dalek factor into his brain hole by like leading him through some sort of brain manipulating archway. And it works like a goddamn charm, but why would the Daleks trick Karl Marx's molten wax statue with a fake Hudson Hawk machine when all they have to do is force him into the goddamn box or, you know, through the arch? Even Jamie says as much a few minutes later. Oh, they could push us through any time they light. Anyway, yes, it works. And that same night, the 1967 gold medalist Karl Marx lookalike under the influence of the Daleks, because otherwise, you know, he's been such a spiffing fellow, hypnotizes the Dockmeister into passing through the Dalek factor archway as well. Take me to your emperor. Spoilers, Doc only pretends to be turned into a Dalek. Pretty much, sort of, yeah. And Markstable looks about as happy as everyone else looks defeated, but when Karl Marx's three martini lunch exit stage left, Doc manipulates the Dalek factor machine in some way and tells Jamie et al. not to worry and to just pass through the archway anyway. So he's clearly fine, he wasn't affected, and presumably he's going to defeat the Daleks by spreading the human factor even further, right? So that the Daleks don't present a threat ever again until the next time when we can conveniently forget about this whole serial along with the fact that they have mastered fucking time travel and clearly should have destroyed the universe bloody ages ago. But also, did I drop a pin in this? I'm not sure. Why did the Daleks test the Dalek factor on Markstable in the first place? Pretty sure it would have been better to test it on someone who wasn't already obeying their orders. God damn it. So close to the end now, folks. Doc meets up with the Emperor and tells him in no way suspiciously that all Daleks should go through the arch now because some of them have been humanized and passing through the archway will dehumanize and re-Dalek their asses. Uh, which happens, they do, because the Emperor thinks this makes sense, right? Because apparently they were pretty rushed to ham-fist an ending for this episode at five minutes to midnight too. Seriously, is this not the dumbest thing ever? Do the Daleks maybe double-check that the Doc has actually been converted into a Dalek drone before following his advice? Nope. Why the hell not? Just tell him, Doc. Uh, d I don't know, tear off your left hand and then punch yourself in the face with a stump. If he's converted, he will do that. He will not question anything. He'll just go ahead and do it. But they just assume that their experiment worked. Makes no sense. So Daleks are being humanized now, and we learn that, yep, Doc obviously reversed the polarity of the neutron flow on that MFR, so the Daleks are actually being humanized rather than Dalekfied. Um, and the humans passing through the arch are obviously unaffected. So now the Daleks are faced with all-out civil war. Super annoying, humanized Daleks are getting on the nerves of real, traditional, honest, hard-working, salt-of-the-earth Daleks, who in turn exterminate annoying Daleks wherever possible. Shit is going down on Scaro, and we get the sudden, totally undramatized death of so many characters. It main characters, in fact. Boom, the Dalek Emperor is apparently killed by humanized Daleks. What? I wonder, by the way, sorry, this is a bit of a, a tangent, but I do wonder if this is the same emperor we meet later on, as in, in Eccleston times, uh, and, well, yeah, sorry, I suppose in other classic Who episodes as well, or if some other Dalek inherited the throne. I'm going to check with JD about that. Hey, JD, I'm assuming you're listening. Pop a comment on this page on whobagwen.com to correct me, please. <laughs> Either way, not sure he's dead, but I'll get back to that in a sec. Kapow! Old Man Waterfield takes a bullet for the dock hammer, telling him with his dying breath to take care of his daughter, Hot Victoria. Kablamatron! Karl Marx's lack of a treadmill kills Kemmel, possibly the only decent human being in this entire goddamn serial, as one of our listeners actually pointed out on Twitter. Yeah, I'm looking at you, SK Radio 2. And then he goes totally bonkers. <laughs> And then Shazam, Doc, Jamie and Victoria escape a burning Dalek city on Scarrow in the TARDIS and we end with our protagonists assuming they've defeated the Daleks once and for all but with a single solitary light pulsating away in the throne room of the Dalek Emperor who may or may not be back but yes, who may very well <laughs> be back. <laughs> end of Evil of the Daleks. Review. 
Whoa, man, I am... I'm sorry if I sped through that. I said that I would. Uh, I'm sorry if I lingered uh, on certain items or obsessed about others. And I hope that you enjoyed the Who Back When synopsis of this serial so far. Here's my review. Okay, so... The time travel aspect of this, well, it makes little sense, and although the story would easily have worked without it, I mean, without the whole Gantwick Airport to Victorian England element, I have to admit, despite the past, what is it, like 45 minutes, an hour of vitriol, I kind of loved it. <laughs> I've said it on Who Back When before, I love it when time travel becomes part of the story. It so rarely does, so how can I possibly complain about its presence here? That being said, I do think they could have done much more with the Victorian angle. Again, along the lines of City of Death with Tom Baker, and they could have easily incorporated more of the actual time travel itself. As in, these two Victorian dudes invent time travel. They are intercepted by the Daleks, but they don't consider using time travel to get themselves out of the mess. For example, you know, all right, never mind. I'm still bumping up the score for it, just not by as much. Secondly, the Technobabble is amazeballs. Or, hang on, let me rephrase that. The human Technobabble is amazeballs. The Dalek Technobabble, I'll address that separately. What do I mean by this? Waterfield and Maxtable, their, like, their scientific devising of time travel is ingenious. I could sit down and listen to them tell me about mirrors and lenses or whatever it was while I rub linseed oil all over my privates all day long. Cannot stress that enough. Love their techno babble. In fact, here, have another soundbite. In here, Doctor, are 144 separate mirrors. And each is of polished metal. Each is subjected to electric charges, all positive. Like repels like in electricity, Doctor. And so next, Waterfield and I attempted to repel the image in the mirrors, wherever we directed. Awesome stuff. So that covers half of the quote-unquote science of this serial. But then we have the Daleks, who are alien beings, and thus I feel legitimately more prone to scientific shenanigans than any other character, right? But the science they wield feels to me, at least compared to the human science, as though it were devised by a, granted, sentient, albeit utterly incompetent lump of shit. The Dalek factor just doesn't seem thought through to me. I know the Daleks are basically tonsils, but that doesn't mean their lack of a figurative backbone is what defines them. The Dalek factor, as I understand it, is not, as you would assume, the titular evil of the Daleks. It's not malevolence or egocentricity. It's not racism or fascism, as it is largely conceived as today. It's just unquestioning, unflinching loyalty. So their objective in this serial is to harness the power of obedience to retroactively brainwash humanity's past into becoming their slaves. Why? Not sure, really. We never find out. To exterminate humanity, one assumes, as that is kind of their pattern. But if that were the case, I'm sorry, but for shit's sake, I've said this so many times on the podcast already, the Daleks can travel through time, if so goddamn facto, they've already won. They don't need the Dalek factor. I disapprove of it anyway, it's just too silly. Show me a story where the Daleks actually use time travel in a clever and devious way. I mean, ugh, not even the great last time war did that properly, in my opinion, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Not sure why this didn't dawn on me when I went through the plot, actually, but I, I just had a brainwave. How the hell did the Daleks know that the TARDIS, let alone the Doctor and Jamie, were at Gatwick Airport in 1967? If they can keep tabs on them to that degree, surely they could just nab them on their own. And does that presuppose that they were also aware of the whole Faceless Ones plot? I, I, I don't know. We don't find out. And how long has Waterfield been running his antique shop in London, and why? Has he just, like, set up shop and waited around for years, you know, in the hopes that Doc and Jamie would show up at the airport? Are the Daleks forcing him to do so? What's the money going towards? It must have taken him years to establish himself on the market with a shop like that, <laughs> and to cultivate relationships and build a reputation and employ henchmen and so on and so forth, you know. And we learn nothing about that. Nothing whatsoever. Oh, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Similarly, so, uh, the, talking about the Dalek factor, similarly, the human factor is preposterous. While I like the schmaltzy idea of basic humanity being independence, uh, a questioning of orders and individualism, I'm thinking of the Dalek names, for instance, um, the way that the human factor is identified, uh, as in through a bunch of shitty celestial toy maker-esque challenges thrust at Jamie, is ridiculous. It's redonkulous. Here's how I would rewrite this serial. Uh, <laughs> A, I'd remove the challenges entirely, and, and I would replace them with a scientific scan. Like, if the Daleks want Jamie, let them want him in order to extract some chemical from his brain, for example, or to suck extra-dimensional energy from his space-time chakra. B, Waterfield and Maxtable invented time travel. Great, I buy that, but let them use it in some way, for Pete's sake. In this serial, I can't help but feel that it's an entirely wasted discovery. Plus, did they build the high-tech travel room in the Victoriana shop, or did the Daleks? I don't feel that it's fully explained where their time travel ends and, and the Daleks' time travel begins. 
In fact, by not giving their time travel discovery more scope, the Daleks one totally eclipses it, which is just a shame, because these these dudes, Waterfield and Maxtable, they're fucking legends in, in the realm of science, right? They must be. C. Justify the time jump to Victorian England. So Doc has a TARDIS, and normally he'd get into it at the end of the last episode and materialize in a new time and place in this one, e.g. in Victorian England. Here, his TARDIS is taken away from him, and someone else, who has already constructed a temporal bridge between Victorian and modern England, transports him back in time instead. But then we totally forget about the goddamn temporal bridge. That's a whole story in itself, and I want to know more about it. We have a Victorian tramp trying to fit into modern England. That's awesome. Tell me more. Like, please. What is the point of introducing it, teasing us with that gorgeous piece of sci-fi, and then blowing it up without ever so much as telling us if there was any collateral damage? Bloody frustrating is what that is. D. Give Kemmel more of a role. He was just the muscle in this one, but there was clearly more to his character than he was allowed to divulge on screen. He fancied Victoria. Okay, let's explore that a bit more, thank you very much. He was heroic and daring, which I feel could have been used to turn the test around so that the Daleks could seize the human factor from him rather than from Jamie. And then he just disappears without a trace. Like, I'm inclined to say the reason for that is that he's not a 1967 BBC shade of white. He's from Trinidad, and thus the only minority representative on the cast. And this wouldn't be the first time a non-white actor was poorly written for in the 1960s, in, in Doctor Who, or in 1960s TV in general. You know, I'm not singling out Doctor Who for that. We've discussed that already on the show. Anyway, I'd, I'd expand on his character to improve the serial. And I think, I, I think there is scope for that. E. Lastly, for shit's sake, I never want to hear Dizzy Dizzy Daleks ever again. Aside from that, keep the rest or just let it fall into place with the aforementioned changes, and I think it'll be fine. Anyway, let me move on to the characters or I will be here all day. <laughs> Doc Meister is fantastic, as per usual. I disapprove of him playing the goddamn recorder now and then, but you can't have everything. Point is, Troughton delivers another stellar performance, perhaps with more of a clever detective air about him in this serial, of which I thoroughly approve, by the way. Um, Jamie, meanwhile, actually frustrates me a bit in this one. Through no fault of his own, his acting is good enough, and he gets to do a bunch of stunts, which I'm sure got the girls in 1967 all hot and bothered. But aside from that, he's just confused, annoying, and overall squandered as an otherwise capable agent of change in Doctor Who. That's just one man's opinion. Victoria Waterfield, well, it's official, or I suppose it will be in the next serial. We have a new companion, Victoria, not to be confused with Vicky or of Vic's vapor rub fame, which in turn was not short for Victoria. She seems nice enough, I suppose. Honestly, I don't feel like I know her at all. She was a damsel in distress in this episode, never got a chance to solve any problems, and wasn't written to impress, if that makes sense. Uh, in fact, her only virtue, as extolled in this serial, is that she's hot as balls. <laughs> or rather, that her mum was, and that she looks just like her. I'll wait until we've seen her in action before I pass judgement on her character. That being said, yeah, she's hot. The ancillary characters, Waterfield, Maxtable, What's-His-Face, Who Loses His Mind, Tarrell, Waterfield's modern-day colleagues and henchmen and whatnot. Yeah, I'm okay with all of them. Yada, yada, yada. In summary, I give the serial a... Oh, man. I'm, give, uh, I'm giving it a 3.2. And that's mainly me bumping it up for the time travel aspect. For context, that is 0.2 more than I gave the previous Trout and Dalek serial, The Power of the Daleks. It's not great, but it's not awful, in my humble opinion. Not as good as the Faceless Ones, and certainly not as good as the Moon Base, obviously. In fact, even though I gave the Underwater Menace a whopping 3.8 at the time, I'm now in hindsight inclined to say that they're about equal in terms of uh, their annoyance. But still, ugh, oh, I'm just going to shoot myself in the foot if I overanalyze my rating. 3.2, that's my final answer. Take it or leave it. Listeners. Two of our esteemed listeners have sent in mini-reviews of Evil of the Daleks, and I'm going to read them out in the order in which they arrived. Yes, in, in order of time, <laughs> because it is a Doctor Who podcast after all. Uh, this first one comes from SGamer82. Steven, 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 Steven. Been a while since I sang that song, man. Nice to hear from you again. Steven says, The Evil of the Daleks is the second and last Dalek story of Troughton's era. There won't be Daleks again for about one Doctor and four companions. 
Holy smokes, I did not know that. I want to say right off the bat that I really enjoyed this serial. One of the bigger issues with Classic Who, the the pacing, didn't really feel present here as I felt something was almost always happening. It helped that we never spent too long on, in a single place. One thing that caught my attention in the early episodes was how mundane everything actually was until the Daleks took over the plot. It was the Doctor and Jamie trying to solve a mystery through completely normal means. I personally found it an interesting change. Yeah, I feel a little bit bad if I'm now, maybe I didn't give it the chance that it deserved, but uh, interesting. I, I think you and I have looked at this story from very different angles. Super interesting. Okay, so Stephen goes on. I particularly like the serial's secondary cast, starting with Edward Waterfield. I liked how his eccentricities in the initial episodes, like referring to a cab as a handsome or not understanding slang terms, can in hindsight be seen as foreshadowing for his actual origin rather than an antique seller's eccentricities. Nice one. Maxtable, like Mavic Chen before him and many others after, never realizes until it's far too late that he's just the pawn. The realization and the gradual breakdown that follows was the kind of fallen arrogance that the chameleons lacked in the faceless ones. Ooh, also, very nice ref. He goes on, I'm genuinely curious, Punkin, to hear your opinion on Kemmel. <laughs> On the one hand, the only non-British human character is a big, mute, brute of a man. On the other, he's the single most valiant character in the entire secondary cast. A similar character will appear in Tomb of the Cybermen, incidentally. Ooh, interesting. Okay, well, I think I've already talked about Kemmel. Uh, I hope that I've answered your question. I think you're absolutely right. He is valiant. He is the only sort of really heroic character. And I think, as I said before, I think since we have this whole let's identify the human factor element to the story, he is a far better candidate for that role. They should have used him. Like, basically, he should have been the guinea pig, not Jamie. Or possibly they could have used Jamie or, you know, intended to use Jamie, but then in the end realized that actually more of the human factor can be found in Kemmel than in Jamie. And it would have been... I, I just think it would have been right. In a way, actually, it's it's a parallel to how... It's something that we discussed in... Um, Fear Her, the Tenants episode, where there's a chap who works for the council, and he was really more deserving of carrying the Olympic torch than the Doctor, but because the Doctor is the Doctor, whoever wrote that episode had the Doctor carry the torch instead. It's, a, it's actually, it's very similar to me. Regardless, yeah, I hope that I've answered your question. Uh, cool. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to carry on with your mini now. Stephen goes on. We have a new companion in Victoria Waterfield, he says, though she doesn't get much spotlight until late in the story. The Trouton stories I've seen, listened to, and in one case, read, interesting, paint her more as a companion in the vein of Susan, Vicky, and Dodo, rather than in the caliber of Barbara or Polly. Still, she does begin the only time in all of Who I can think of where the Doctor has multiple Earthling companions, each from Earth's past rather than the current present day. Very interesting. Oh, okay, yeah, the, that can set up a very interesting dynamic. He goes on, the Dalek and their Emperor give us good showing. It's not often we see them so thoroughly out with the Doctor as they did here by using his human factor studies to discover the Dalek factor, not to mention trying to trick the Doctor by posing as one of the humanized Daleks. On the other hand, trying to hypnotize the Doctor into walking into his doom was not a stroke of genius. <laughs> One question that occurred to me, though, is in assuming the Dalek factor archway would affect him, could that mean the Daleks before now never realized the Doctor was not actually a human being? Uh, yeah, I think you're right about that. Did I, I, I don't think I even pointed this out. The reason it doesn't have an effect on him is because he even says this. He's not human. He is from a different planet. So, you know, his system works differently. I think you're totally right about that, Stephen. Yeah, they probably think he's human. In fact, I'm now thinking, sorry, I just interrupted myself there. I think in, is it the chase or possibly the Daleks' master plan? I think he's referred to as, or like he and his companions are referred to as the humans. So yeah, maybe they just don't know yet. Yeah, good point. All right. Stephen goes on. It is Jamie, however, who is the highlight of the story to me. Much of the story focuses on him and his basic humanity. He plays the gallant knight going off to rescue Victoria, defeats and befriends Kemmel, and even calls out the Doctor for his perceived callousness in a way much like Ian and Stephen before him. Only when it seems like the Doctor himself has been taken down does he himself begin to feel any kind of despair. I really enjoy The Evil of the Daleks, and with that in mind, I am giving it a 4.3 out of 5. Holy smokes. Steven, you have a huge heart. 4.3 is a fantastic mark. You're making me feel like I didn't give this quite the mark that it deserved. I'm not going to go back now and change it, but I'm going to have to, you know, I made my bed, I'm going to have to line it. But 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I disagree with you about Jamie. Agree to disagree, man. Jamie really annoyed me in this one, but that's fine. It's not really Jamie's fault. Uh, he annoyed me in this one because of the plot, as I said. The whole human factor thing. I didn't like that. Anyway, awesome mini review. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to tell Stephen that this is an awesome mini review. How can you do that? Well, you can reply to his mini review on whobackwhen.com, where you will find it embedded. But you can also follow him on Twitter, which you should anyway. He is at sgamer82. That is 82, the number. Next up, we have, a, we have a listener mini that's been sent in from Chris. Hello, Chris. Thank you very much for your mini review. Chris says, So the Evil of the Daleks picks up where the Faceless Ones episode 6 ended with a relatively nonplussed doc telling Jamie, We lost the TARDIS. And evil begins with them not only finding it, but chasing it. They do some snooping, get a small lead, and then we find out about other people in the serial where we get information that DJ don't have yet. Wait, hang on, wait, are you referring to them as DJ? Are you actually referring to them as DJ? Had I referred to them as DJ before? Is this just a case of great minds think alike? That is awesome, man. <laughs> Alright, so he goes on. And then DJ keeps snooping. This pattern repeats for a bit. It would have been a fun surprise when the serial wasn't called The Evil of the Daleks, but I really didn't buy into the acting of the grumpy Santa doppelganger that is helping the Daleks. Uh, I take it that's Carl Marxtable. <laughs> Waterfield and Kemmel were both fairly interesting characters who have a little more depth to them than the one-off characters of other serials, which in my opinion is interesting considering that Victoria's character is just a useless and helpless girl. And he adds in brackets, not another one in Doctor Who. I'm looking at you, Dodo and Vicky. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. She was just the damsel in distress in this one. Totally true. Chris goes on. The Daleks want the human factor and I love the playful Daleks. Ooh, all right, fine which is fun while it lasts. So it should be a quite memorable serial, but I always forget about it until I watch in, which in a way makes my score go up slightly because when I watch it, I feel like I'm rediscovering it. Slide note, in this already longer than I planned mini review, how come the Daleks are looking for a human factor when we know that the real reason that the humans defeat them is the Doctor? Yeah, good point. I made that same point, dude. Uh, he goes on, shouldn't they be looking for the Time Lord factor or the Doctor factor? If we wait about a decade, I can't be bothered to do the math, who back when will review The Witch's Familiar, where we'll kind of see that? Ooh, I hadn't considered that. Yeah, that's exactly what happens, in fact. <laughs> that is a super good point. He goes on, all in all, a fun serial. It has its fun parts, and it has its will the scene ever end moments, but in the end, it still is a serial that I often forget about, despite love, love, loving the second Doctor. He's usually the one I call my favorite Doctor. Sometimes I flip-flop to Davison. Last notes before my score, it's an odd feeling to root for the Human Factor Daleks. I give it a middle of the road. 2.9. Really only hair off from a 3, but I can't quite put it there. That's what she said. <laughs> For context, I gave the chase a 2.9 as well before I started submitting mini reviews. Uh, it's a fair score. Like the chase, it was a little too silly at times, but not without its great moments. And he adds a PS in a Dalek voice. Dizzy, dizzy, dizzy Daleks. Why, why, why obey without question? Ugh. Ugh. Sorry, I probably should have said that in a Dalek voice. Uh, oh, dude. God. Uh, awesome mini. Thank you very much for sending that in. Yeah, I totally agree with you about the whole let's identify the doctor factor rather than the human factor makes way more sense. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to tell Chris what an awesome mini review he has sent in, if you want to agree or disagree with anything he said, just reply to his review on whobackwhen.com. I'm not at liberty to disclose his Twitter handle. <laughs> Okie dokie, uh, I think that's actually it for today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I really hope that you've enjoyed this review of The Evil of the Daleks. I'm super glad to be back and recording. Having sat here for an hour and twenty or whatever and recorded, I feel way better, way more jazzed now than I did like an hour and a half ago. <laughs> Yeah, it's the healing power of who and of who back when. So, thank you very much for listening. Feel free to high-five me online. You can find me on Twitter. I'm at Ponkin. Here's a soundbite of JD singing how you spell that. P-O-N-K-E-N, Ponkin. <laughs> Thanks, JD. And obviously, don't forget to go to whobackwhen.com, where you can find tons of episodes, tons of reviews, submit a mini review of your own, and so on and so forth. All this is going to be said in the outro that I will be copy-pasting after this soliloquy. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much again for listening. Catch you in the next episode. If it is a new Who review, it will be Smith and Jones, which we're reviewing tomorrow. If it's a classic Who review, it will be Tomb of the Cybermen. And if it is an audio Who review, it will be The Scapegoat. That's right. 
No more Wearing Dawn reviews. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for now. Rock on. Be rad and excellent to each other. And cha ciao. Kablamo. Did you enjoy the show? Then please do what the cosmos compels you to and spread the gospel of who back when. Tell your friends. Don't have any friends? No problemo. Tell some strangers. Like us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash who back when. All in one word. Are you on Google Plus? The finals on Google Plus. That's plus who back when. And when you do, tell us why you're on Google Plus. Who back when just got its very own Twitter account. No lie. So give us a follow. You guessed it. That's at who back when. All in one word. Check us out on SoundCloud, vote us up on Reddit, listen to us on Stitcher, and head on over to our website, whobackwhen.com, where you can leave a comment, submit a review of your own, and peruse our visual index of aliens, monsters, and more, which increases in Kablamos with every episode. And lastly, give us a rating and review on iTunes. Not only would it make us super chuffed, and it really, really would, but as thanks, we will transmigrate your iTunes nom de plume into the credit list of trailers for fake Doctor Who audiobooks produced by Who Back When. Have a poke around our bonus episodes to make more sense of that. That's it. Rock on and be rad and excellent to each other. Catch your ear balls in our next classic Who review, new Who review, or, <laughs> still funny, audio Who review. Cha ciao. Who back when?